So we'll start with doing some introduction, introductions. So my name's Aaron Evans. Most of you probably know me because you're obviously on this uh, webinar. Um, I work for an organization called Flow State and as part of our kind of ongoing, uh, I suppose, mission to improve sales as uh, an industry, but also improve salespeople. We put together webinars like this where we get special guest speakers to come on and share their insight and tips. And hopefully you guys leave here with a ton of value. In fact, I know you will, because I know Mark really, really well. We've worked together on a few projects and uh, we talk to each other a lot on LinkedIn. Um, Mark, I'll hand over to you before I do, I'll do a very brief introduction. Um, so you are a TED talker, you're a guest speaker, you're a body language expert, you're an author. I think you're an actor as well. I know. I know you've got a few credits on. Um, back in the day. Back in the day. <laughs> on IMDb, you're also the author of this book, which I absolutely love, which is winning, winning body language. And anyone who's listening or, or dialing into this now, I fully recommend this book. It's an absolute masterpiece. But I'll hand over to you and just give us a brief introduction about yourself and what you've been up to. Yeah. So Mark Bowden, expert in human behaviour and body language, and I help people all over the world to stand out, to win trust, to gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7, including, as we were talking about just a little bit earlier, Zoom. Uh, I have a huge amount of clients in the sales arena and sales enablement. So really, I see myself as leadership and sales enablement. Uh, and the two things are the same as far as I'm concerned. Both leadership and sales is about how can you easily change people's minds? How, you can, how can you economically change people's minds or certainly move their minds along into some decisions and some out outcomes that are best for them and best for you and your organization? That's, that's my pitch, Aaron. I hope you're buying. Oh, absolutely, mate. Well, absolutely. I always buy through you, hence why I've got your book, right? Um, so look, I, I want to start super, super broad. But before we do, I just want to spend a moment talking about the sponsors of, the, of this webinar. Um, and that we're really conscious about who we pick as sponsors. And they're free sponsors as well. They don't pay anything to sponsor our webinar. The first one is Vidyard, which is a really, obviously, hot topic, what we're talking about now. Vidyard is, is basically a free video platform that you can use throughout your sales motion. So you can record videos, you can record demos, you can record outbound videos as well. And the second sponsor, which is uh, directly tied to Vidyard, Yard is sales feed, which I'm sure you guys have come across before. Uh, influencers like Will Aiken are contributors there, who's brilliant, follow his stuff as well. Give those guys a follow afterwards and, um, and thank you so much for sponsoring it. So we're going to start really, really broad, right? Deliberately really, really broad. Um, I understand that 55% give or take of communication is non-verbal, right? So it's in our body language and, and, and how, we, how we behave physically. But what exactly is body language? Hopefully that's broad enough for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty broad. OK, so let's just talk about what we call those Moravian figures at the start, which usually gets kind of executed as, I don't know, like 93 percent of all communication is nonverbal or something like something along those lines. Look, here's what we understand from that is that when we are making a decision about somebody else's feelings and intentions towards us now, the majority of the information that our brain is looking for is what they're doing physically, the context that they're in, and the music of their voice, all of which we call nonverbal communication. Aaron, if I'm trying to, if you walk into a room with me and I'm kind of trying to get the sense, is, is Aaron on the level with me? Does he like me? Is he upset with me? Is he happy to be here? My brain isn't looking for what you're saying. It's looking for your behaviors and your context and your tonality. That's how I get what we call a theory of mind, a theory about how you're feeling about me and the situation. Is my theory always accurate? No, <laughs> you know, it's about a 50 50 chance as to whether it's accurate or what not. It depends to it, 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 it tends to default to negatives. It tends to be rather be safe than sorry. OK, so we need to know that about our gut instinct. It tends to want to be safe rather than sorry. So one last thing to say about body language is that body language is a metaphor. That word body language, nonverbal communication is not a language. It doesn't have the things that language has. It can't displace, which means it can't talk about the past or the future like my English language can at mm. the moment or any other language that you would speak would be able to displace in time. And it's not, for example, self-referential. I can't give you a wink about a wink that happened in the past. Right. You just get confused. 
you just go what the hell are you thinking and feeling right now mark and you default to negatives okay mm. so we use body language which is a metaphor for nonverbal communication okay we use body language both to send out signals and to take in signals about how we might be thinking and feeling and therefore Aaron you know to tie this up that's why it's so important for anybody in sales or leadership because if you think it might be important to be able to send out signals about how you feel and also be able to gauge signals really well about how somebody's thinking or feeling then mm. nonverbal communication is always important for you so interesting though right because because language is so new to human beings in the grand scheme of things right yeah actual, actual language and obviously it was a massive part of our development hence why our brain's so big is why language came about but so much of body language and again i appreciate that you explaining it as a metaphor is subconscious one of the things that i'm always interested in particularly with our profession of, of selling how do we turn um body language in from a subconscious activity that we do to a conscious thing considering that it is so prevalent and ubiquitous and it's it's we're doing it all the time and i'm even doing it now as i'm talking to you yeah, yeah. How, how do we how do we turn it from a subconscious behavior into a conscious behavior yeah okay so i think there are a couple of elements important elements to this first of all to turn something into a conscious behavior you're going to need a conscious goal so that you can monitor yourself you know look so for example here's one of the conscious goals that i give a lot of the clients that i coach around leadership and around especially this one around sales i say to people look your primary goal okay is to improve somebody's mood okay so my primary goal here before i try and do anything else before i try and you know educate you or tell you about my product or my service or change your mind in any way my primary goal is to improve your mood the gamble being that you're not going to really pay attention to anything that i say in a bad mood or if you do it will be framed by that bad mood and look you might not be in a bad mood in the first place you may be in a pretty good mood but i'm going hang on if i can turn that mood even better you'll like me more and if you like me more or like being around me more there's more benefit to being around me you'll see more benefit in my product my service my ideas for you my leadership okay so primary goal i'm going to say is uh Im improve the mood now now the question is is well what would i have to do non-verbally in order to improve your mood because you decide my mood and you decide somewhat your own mood based on my nonverbal behaviors. So what are the behaviors of improving somebody's mood? Okay, now look, equally, I could go, hey, I want to I want to upset you. Okay, now I don't know why I'd want to do that. But you know, I can think of some reasons in sales and leadership why it's actually could be quite strategic to upset people they're not tactics i would use as a as a general rule or a good general rule but i can see some purpose some utility in them well again i've got to go okay my job is i'm going to walk into the room and upset aaron okay uh how am i going to do that most economically i'm going to use my nonverbal behavior now i need a vocabulary what are the things that i would need to do non-verbally in order to overtly or covertly upset Aaron. If I have that vocabulary, I can then start to display that vocabulary. So we need a goal and we need to collect vocabulary that will best help us execute on that goal. So first of all, we need to build our knowledge, Aaron, and we need to have some self-knowledge as well, going, what do I want to get mm. out of this meeting? Anyway, I hope that makes sense to you. Let's talk about some of those tactics then, right? So you mentioned the one mm. before there around um, changing someone's mood for, for for positive. What would some mm. of the tangible tactics be to do precisely that? I mean, I, I remember when you did your TED talk, you walked on stage and you said, the first thing you said was, you've already decided whether you like me or, or dislike me, which I thought was yeah. fascinating. But if you wanted to leave a good impression on someone and, and have that goal of changing their mood, what are some of the actual body language displays that you could do? Yeah, okay. So I'm going to talk about, first of all, body language displays that are going to decrease your neural load. So make your brain have to work less hard. Because when your brain works less hard, you get happier. 
you get right. <laughs> no, why, and you know why wouldn't you it loves it loves to do less it loves your brain loves economy essentially okay so here are some signals that are going to cause your brain to work less hard open palm gestures Okay, no tools, no weapons, nothing in my hands. Your brain is obsessed with what do I have in my hands? Even virtually, you want to know what do I have in my hands? And if I don't let you see that I have something or nothing, your brain has to work to predict that, which is what I'm doing with you right now. And the moment I pop my hands into shot and give you open palm gestures, okay, no tools, no weapons, or I even could pop my hands into shot and let you see easily that I have a tool in my hand that might be of benefit to you, especially if I start showing you and saying, hey, Aaron, I'm going to write down what you said right there, because that's, that's really key. That's really important. Okay, so I'm going to show you more of what's happening for a start, because that lessens your neural load, because it doesn't have to imagine anymore. And it doesn't have to imagine to the negative. And I'm going to show you open palm gestures. I'm also going to show you lots of what we call baton gestures. These are the gestures that conduct along to the rhythm of my speech. Okay, so because your your Broca's area that does language and is very, very new, possibly in some aspects as new as only 200,000 years old. So super new. Okay, it not only likes to hear the sounds that I'm making to detect language, but it wants to see um, see the meaning as well. It wants to see the rhythm. It wants to see the cadence of it in order to match those two things up and go, what's my prediction of what Mark is saying? So if I show you baton gestures, your brain goes, oh, that's so easy to understand, Mark, because I also see his rhythm as well. And last thing on this, Aaron, that I'm going to show you to make you comfortable by lowering your neural load is what I call illustrator gestures. And I just did it there, lowering your neural load. And I did an illustrator with a baton gesture as well, okay? And so your brain goes, wow, I even saw Mark lower and he batoned with the words. How easy is it to understand Mark? Now look, I could disappoint always by talking utter nonsense and you go, oh, it's so easy to talk to Mark, but it's just inevitably he's ridiculous and makes no sense. OK, so we can always disappoint. But if I've got good content for you, if I've got good help, if I'm truly trying to help you and I deliver plenty of nonverbal information for you, you'll and you'll feel better about me and therefore better about the content, the product, the service, the leadership I mm. have for you. Hope that makes sense again. Yeah, it's super interesting. Really, really interesting. Really interesting. Because fundamentally, what, what you're doing is creating accessibility, right? I think that, that for me feels like a key point here is that your body language can be used as a conduit to help people access ideas, help people understand things, and also build trust with you. Um, and again, like when you think about what selling fundamentally is, is that sometimes we need to take some very complex ideas, some, some real conceptual stuff, and turn it into something that's accessible and consumable to the person that we're talking to. That's kind of why I love selling is because all selling is, is just, it's just a, a great big metaphor for communication, right? And it's, for me, the most important tool that we have as human beings. It's what separates us from the animal kingdom, I feel, is, is being able to effectively communicate. Just out of interest, sort of a side question, when, when did you become interested in this then? Because it's super fascinating. Yeah, I mean, it really was around that animal kingdom. When I was a kid uh, in the UK, I guess, I guess like me, you were, a, you were a kid in the UK. Did you grow up in the UK, Aaron? I did, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I'm probably a little bit older than you, but, um, but when I was a kid, just natural history shows were, were just, just so much great natural history. OK, great shows with great photography about animals. And also, of course, there was Des Desmond Morris's Man Watching uh, as well, now called People Watching, and uh, which was the natural history of human beings. And I got obsessed with, like, how do animals move? How does that biology function? How do human beings move? How does our biology function? How do we work in social groups? And I put that together with an obsession as well with art. How do images work? And how do images 
images, especially moving images, which I would see in film and TV and theatre, how do those moving images change our feelings, change mm. our theories about how the world is and how we're feeling? So I got super obsessed with, with persuasion and influence, essentially. How do you change most economically somebody's theories about how the world is working and how they're feeling and how other people are feeling by changing the moving pictures of of living things in front of them it's really really interesting and actually it's inspired a couple of uh, cool questions in the comments uh, or i should say the q a um, lovely there's there's two there that are actually quite similar right and um first of all some good people are saying that there's some good value in the baton gestures and i've got, found that super useful as well so can you use body language too much which seems like a consistent theme that's coming up in the, in the q a can you be too articulate with your body <laughs> yeah okay so um there's no bad behaviors only results that you wanted or didn't want okay <laughs> so so of course yes you can you can underdo it you can overdo it okay and and the line between the two though though i can make usually some good general generalizations because of expertise in it but the but the absolute point of too much or too little is is very complex and depends on who are you who are they where are you right now what's going on it's very very contextual but look understand this you might look at my gestures and you might go hey you know mark seems to be doing quite a lot well you know i'm here to demonstrate OK, I'm I'm here for you to go. Oh, yeah, I really saw that when Mark said baton gestures. I saw those baton gestures in real life. In some situations, the only baton gestures I might be giving is the nodding of my head very gently. OK, I may not use my hands at all, but I am focusing on, OK, give them some baton gestures to go along with this. OK. Now, can it be overdone? Yeah, it can be overdone. Culture will play a part in that. For example, um, you can overdo in some cultures how close your gestures go to the other person, how close they get. In a, in a good generalized North American business culture, you can reach out quite far. Okay, you can go into, you can go fairly close into other people's territory. I usually judge territory around where have they placed their mobile phone. Okay, if they, wherever they've placed their mobile phone, over that limit, you are now in their territory. Okay, and and in North American culture, you're not going to go into their territory unless you want to be territorially aggressive. Now, you go to other cultures. Uh, I could make a specific generalization to island cultures that get invaded quite a lot. Okay, you do you don't even go close to their territory. <laughs> okay, they will they will be taking up less territory, especially if they're an island culture that gets invaded quite a lot and has a high uh, population. Yeah, good bets on that are going to be Japan and the UK. In yeah. Japan and the UK, you might think well, they're not similar at all. Super similar. Small islands get invaded throughout history consistently. OK, and consistently have to be aggressively defensive or they're often getting conquered. It's one of the two. And the population is high for the land mass. People are going to be very protected of their of their territory. They're going to protect their own territory and they aren't going to want you to come into theirs. So the gestures, you know, whatever they are, are closer to the body. They're smaller because everything stands the chance of invading other people's territory. So look, long always simple questions will elicit a long answer from me. So yeah, you have to everybody has to excuse me around that because because I really want to give you the true answers around this. You Brilliant know. answer. In fact, it's been validated by Trevor. He said fantastic answer. Thank you. We're Thank you. Quite a few um, questions come through, which I'm going to address in a moment. Or a question, right. mind, which is um, in in sales, like page one, chapter one, you're, you're, you're taught, and certainly when I first got into sales, was this idea around mirroring, right? How it's um, a useful tool for building rapport and, 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 and fundamentally, like, um, you know, getting on sync, in sync with your client. So talk to us a little, bit, a little about, a bit about mirroring. Is it a myth? Is it true? Is it as valuable as people say it is? Yeah, well, look, first of all, it's not a myth. It's absolutely true. We mirror each other and we do it unconsciously, okay? We, we look, one of the reasons 
Aaron, we might even get on so well, is, is if people look at us, because we both come from the, the UK, and whether our genetic lines are very similar or not, there are just you know, facial expressions that get imprinted on us. Look at us, we've both got long hair and we take, but we both take a lot of flack for it as well <laughs> on LinkedIn. We both take a lot of flack uh, for it, okay? And so, and so there's mirroring happening there. We're both interested in the same subjects. We're both fascinated by, by sales and how you do it, okay? So there's already mirroring happening there and we already are gonna be mirroring each other unconsciously okay so to a certain extent with people who are our like already and who like us already it's going to naturally happen yeah. then comes you know as you say page one of of 101 sales you know maybe a little bit old school but potentially new school as well of hey you should mirror people yeah. Yeah, yeah, to a certain extent. I mean, you're going to do it anyway to test out, is this person like me or not? And what are they feeling? One of the ways that we do our theory of mind is to mirror each other, first of all, to get a sense of what is it like to be in this other person's skin? How does it feel to me? Oh, they must be feeling that. That's either true or false or something in between. But that's the way we do. We do theory of mind is partly mirroring. And here's the problem, Aaron. If you come in with a bad mood... <laughs> Okay, and I've set it as my goal to improve your mood. First step, improve Aaron's mood. And I start mirroring you like mm. that, that is, that's not going to work. I'm going to mirror you. You're going to mirror me. We are going to spiral into a negative mood. And I can't probably check, though there'll be some outliers to this. I most likely can't change your mind when you're in a bad mood. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to, first of all, accept and even congratulate all the behaviors that I think are getting you closer to a buying state, mm. okay? And, and by that, I'm not meaning the, the close, and I know you know this, Aaron, but, but you know, part of a modern moving somebody towards a buying state is that curiosity, is that investigation. So let's just say getting closer to a buying state is can we get curious? Anything that I see you do that looks to me like curiosity, yeah, I'm going to mirror that. <laughs> I'm going to go, okay, I'm going to join you on that. You're going to see my head nod on that. You might even verbally, you know, hear me go, ah, oh, great. Mm -hmm. You know, as you, as you lean forward, and go, let me have a look at that. You know, yeah. I might go, oh, great, yeah, and lean forward as well. Because I want us both to get into curiosity. Because I think, and you, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, Aaron, but I think the modern salesperson is trying to get alongside the buyer, see things from their angle. Now, see things from their angle with, with a, a, a different potential for curiosity, a potential for seeing other angles, uh, some knowledge that they may not have. So, you know, the knowledge of, I got relationships with subject matter experts, I could pull them in. Mm. You know, let's get our, our chief, you know, tech in to, to really look at this with you. But I can get, I can mirror, I can get alongside somebody and investigate that way that's what I think is important about about mirroring. But I'd, I'd love to hear your angle on it because you'll have seen everything under the sun around well, you, that. Funny enough, you, you whether you've done it in, inadvertently or not, but you've basically described the modern research on on where selling is heading, which is it's less about selling nowadays than it's about helping buyers buy. Um, and to do that, you've got to have a unique position, which is often knowledge and expertise yeah. and a set of customer insight or, or valuable insight that they can't get anywhere else out in the market because of what's happened with the internet. The buyers are so informed nowadays. By the time they're speaking to a salesperson, they're so often so late down the buying cycle. The help isn't actually about being sold to, it's about being helped. And everything that you're describing there along walking alongside the buyer is, is super accurate to what all the research is saying out there. And this is cutting edge research that's as, as recent as this year. Um, so yeah, really, really interesting. I, I used to work with a guy many years ago and he said that um, he'd mirror a candidate um, for as long as he can. And if he liked the candidate, he'd edge forward in his seat to see if the candidate would 
uh, would, would do the same thing because then they'd realize that they're in sync and that the candidate is, is, is you know, liking them. And that's when he'd close on the candidate after he did that. So nice. it's interesting hearing you talk about it. We get some great questions come through. Um, Lovely. Guppy Leaders just said, um, do you use different gestures when on a Zoom versus face to face? Would you uh, over exaggerate gestures on on Zoom? or uh, as you're not in the same room as them? That's actually a good question, because obviously when you're in person, you can probably see a lot more and pick up a lot more cues. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, look, here's the thing. When I show up on video for you, you're used to me doing all the work, essentially. If I show up in your office, in a restaurant with you, you now have a social obligation to engage with me. But but we've got ourselves in these patterns that say whenever somebody shows up on a screen, you know, that monkey will dance and we'll just sit back and judge because mm. screen performance um, is a is is passive for the audience on when you when you switch on Netflix, the the performers aren't going, come on, join in. Yeah. Come on, ask me a question. It's like that, that you they're making you a passive consumer. OK, well, that's the trigger here is I show up on a Zoom call with you and you end up being a passive consumer and, and maybe back in the old days of sales, some people would have gone, well, that's exactly what I want. I want a passive consumer. I want somebody who's going to passively go, all right, I'll buy I'll buy that. But that's not a modern that's not a modern buyer. A modern buyer is not a passive consumer. They are an active contributor to a lot of the process of, of trying to create, find, investigate the right product, the right service, who's the right leader for them. So I need to, on, on Zoom, I need to provoke you into being an active contributor. And one of the ways I do that to that gesture point is I'm very active with my gestures. I'm keeping reminding you that I am a live human being right now. I'm saying the word you a lot. I'm pointing at you down mm. the camera. If I came into your office and did this, you'd see me out. You would you'd start getting aggressive back <laughs> on this on this modality because your instinct knows you're very, very safe and is being triggered into being passive. I need to keep waking you up. So yeah, my gestures come into the frame a lot more. They come forward towards you. Whereas if I was in a room with you right now, I'd sit back from you a lot more. My hands would be in what I call the truth plane down here. Lots of open palm gestures here. This would be very, very engaging for you. Very, very trustworthy for you. Because I'm already in the room. There's already a high risk for you so i'm lowering risk at the moment on camera okay i'm raising risk mm. for you right now to get you engaged it's a fundamental difference the live in the room performance yeah. and the camera performance and you've got to understand the camera performance for a live interaction is not like a camera performance for tv and film okay you cannot just sit there and move your mouth on a film, you can. Films were designed to be seen on a on a screen which is forty feet high. Mm. You can do nothing. Beautiful lenses, beautiful film. You could do nothing, and the audience, because they paid to be there and they're buying popcorn and they're out on a date, will go. I love this. The person's doing nothing. It's fantastic. That's not this. What a brilliant answer. It's honestly, so much value in that. Great question, uh, Gurpreet, and, and brilliant answer, Mark, as well. There's, there's a really good question that's come through from Louise Ward. Um, Lovely. Said, uh, well, first of all, I would never want to play you in poker because I think you probably have my house and my car keys within about two and a half minutes. But she's, she said, like, I've heard that poker players um, give things away with their hands and movement. But if you don't mind, Louise, I kind of want to broaden this out because poker playing for the salesperson is actually the negotiation. That's probably the best way of seeing it, right? Um, um, if we look at it from that perspective, is there any body language that we should look out for during a negotiation or is there any body language that we should be demonstrating during a negotiation that is conducive to not necessarily winning the negotiation because we don't control the variable, which is the other person, but making the negotiation run smoothly fundamentally? Yeah, lovely, lovely question. Uh, OK, so first thing here, which is important in poker, the most important thing in poker, and I believe the no most important thing in negotiation 
in poker, if you don't understand the mathematics of the game, you're going to lose. It doesn't matter about any body language, hand after hand after hand, on aggregate, you will lose if you do not understand the mathematics, okay, and, and the statistics and the probability involved okay once you understand the mathematics the statistics the probability involved then you might want to look at nonverbal. then you might want to go i understand the probability of the cards that the other person is holding but how do i now narrow it down even further to what is probable i want to know are they optimistic or pessimistic about that hand of cards yeah now this also means that they must understand the probability of your hand because if they don't understand the probability their optimism and pessimism will be out of whack okay mm -hmm. if nobody knows how to play the game at a high level the game just falls down so we've all played game a game of poker with our friends who know nothing about poker and neither do we and it's great fun and everybody's a disaster. One person comes out as a winner in the end and nobody can work out how, okay? They probably just innately understood the probability and the mathematics better than anybody else, okay? I think it's the same with a negotiation. Do you understand the probability, the mathematics of what is going on here? Do you understand as much as you can about the values involved and what is important to people and what is not important to people? OK, and and I would be looking at the optimism and the pessimism around this. So look, in poker, the way we tell the way scientifically we tell optimism or pessimism about what somebody is holding in their hand is how they push in the chips. Mm -hmm. Is it fluid or staccato? Do they push it in in a fluid manner? Yeah, that's optimistic. Or do they push it in a, in a staccato manner? That is pessimistic, okay? Now, we've got to make our judgment about what is fluid and staccato for them and for each of the players involved, okay? So we need what we call a baseline around that. Now, so when we come to, when we come to the negotiation, I want to understand, is this person optimistic about the way this is going or are they pessimistic? about the way this is going okay so i need to baseline them around what they do when they're optimistic and what they do what they do when they're pessimistic and i might be able to do that around asking them to tell me early on in the discussion around when things have gone well for them and when things have gone badly okay and i'm going to look for things that they do on the story of when it went well and things that they do on the story of when it went badly. And I'm gonna keep on watching out for those, but I'm gonna watch for those across the sales cycle. Cause mm -hmm. I want to be a good judge of going, I think they're optimistic right now. Yeah, possibly. So it's always possibly, it's never they are, possibly they're optimistic right now, or possibly they're getting pessimistic right now. And what would I like to do about that? Would I like to make them more pessimistic? Or would I like to move them towards optimism? And therefore, do I have the vocabulary to be able to do that? So again, Aaron, I'm always concerned. I give very long answers because I want to give you the right answer. But I, but I, hope, I hope the question had got something out of that one. It's all being validated in the chat, mate. People are saying great answers. So yeah, really, really Lovely. good. There's an interesting one that's come up, actually, uh, from Rafael Fernandez. He said, um, are there differences in using and reading body language techniques when it comes to basically males or females? Is there anything different in those two profiles? Yeah, okay. So there isn't enough of, um, well, there's, okay, so there's two major, let's say there's gonna be two major differences which are to do with biology. First of all is the physical biology of a male or a female, okay? A male has primary and secondary sexual characteristics and a female has primary and secondary sexual characteristics. This, by the way, is going back to my first biology classes, which to my understanding, nothing in science has changed about this. You have primary sexual characteristics and secondary sexual characteristics, okay? When under stress and pressure, when under stress and pressure, the male or the female will protect their primary 
and secondary sexual characteristics, okay? And that will cause some differences for male and female because the primary and sexual characteristics and secondary sexual characteristics have a difference, okay? Simple as that. Now, let's go on to some other elements that might happen. Oh, by the way, so, so a male under stress and pressure, may, you may well see them cover their primary sexual characteristics here, okay? A female is more likely to go up here to the uterus area. Yeah. Now, having said that, there's more the same about males and females than there's ever going to be any difference, okay, in the fundamental biology of the body. Okay. For example, males and females, as a good generalization, we all have finger joints and wrist joints. Okay. We all have elbow joints as well. Only the ones of us that do not have, for whatever reason, hands or arms, okay, are not going to have those. The fundamental biology is you get those, okay? Now, under stress and pressure, we'll also protect those joints as well. So now I can go, is the person, uh, are they covering, are they protecting primary sexual characteristics and finger joints or wrist joints? as well, or elbow joint as well? Are they even more protected? So potentially more displaying uh, pressure. Now look, another fundamental between male and female. Males and females, we all of us produce testosterone, androgen and estrogen, okay? Whole bunch of other neurotransmitters as well, okay? But, but I'm gonna mention those, those three and let's focus on uh, estrogen and testosterone because as a really good gamble i will win this in the casino not with every single male or every single female but if i swab test a large group of females or a large group of males the females on aggregate will test higher for estrogen than than the males in testosterone you can you can pull out an individual and it will skew but on aggregate okay i'm going to win in the casino on that one estrogen and testosterone fundamentally change behaviors for example just one example testosterone will cause if you get it at a, at a young age okay your bones are going to grow bigger okay your vocal cords are going to become more flaccid okay and you will grow more hair Okay, don't care who you are, if I give you testosterone, it's happening to you. Okay, now there's another interesting thing that's going to happen to you if I give you testosterone. Your brain is going to see the world as having less risk in it. Okay, I don't care who you are, male or female. Okay, I don't care how high or low your testosterone levels are. If I give you that injection of testosterone or I throw it into the air because it can get in through your skin and through your nose, suddenly you're going to go, I don't think it's such a risky world anymore. And that's fundamentally going to change your behaviors because now the world, the outside environment is impacting you in a different way. You don't see it as having so much power mm. against you. You might see yourself as having more power. And so if I've got um, somebody who has a lot of testosterone, they're more likely to be territorially aggressive and they won't even know it. I'm like, man, you're in, you're in my space. I'm going to go, what? Mm. I didn't even see the risk of me being in your space. And of course, that could be a female. Of course. But if I'm in the casino and gambling, I'm going to gamble. It's more likely a male. Mm. I'm going to lose now and again. Okay, I get that. I'm going to lose now and again. But over 100 bets, you know, or certainly scientifically, let's say over 500 bets, Okay, as a good sample model, I'm winning in the casino on that one. Okay, super interesting. So I hope that makes that makes sense. So look, so look, no, no, so so there will be differences to male and female based on that. Okay, the, the last thing I need to say about this, Aaron, is is yes, absolutely, there are cultural expectations of what a male or a female should do. Yeah. Okay, we can defeat those cultural expectations or we can buy into them and display them. There is risk and reward. If I walk into, if I go to Japan, there are cultural expectations of what a male does. Okay, I'm not saying they're right or wrong, it's just cultural expectations. Okay, 
Okay, it's been, Japan's been there for thousands of years. I'm not saying they've got it right, but it is what it is right now. Could it change? Yes, absolutely. Is it changing? Maybe, likely, I don't know. I don't live there. I'm, I'm, I'm not up on that. But I know there are cultural expectations for a male and a female. If I go in, okay, and I decide to do the expectations of the other, yeah, there's a penalty for that. There's a there's a there's a risk. Mm -hmm. I have to pay a penalty. Is there a prize? There could be. So now I'm going to go. I'm going to weigh up the prize versus the penalty. I'm going to go in and do behaviors that they're not expecting because I want to get the goal. Will I have to pay for that? Yes, I will. Am I going to win more than I paid? Well, if I'm if I'm not, I don't know why I'm doing it. I mean, again, I could see some reasons why I would, but I don't quite know why. I mean, is that the hill that I want to die on? Maybe. So let's let's go up the hill, you know, and die on it. I got no problem about being brave around that. Like, go do it. But there are no bad behaviors, no good behaviors, just results that you wanted or didn't want. It's interesting. It's tying into the question that Herb asked there around, are there cultural um is there a difference in i suppose idiosyncrasies within culture which i'd expect right because you know you know as an example italians typically are far more expressive or mediterraneans in general are far more expressive but it's interesting here for the perspective of of the genders as well just just to bring it back again sort of to move more into the kind of sales motion side of it obviously we've spoken about video uh, as in like video conferencing like right mm -hmm. now we've spoken about face to face when you're in front of someone I suppose the, the last piece of the puzzle when it comes to the body language is actually when we record videos and use products like Vidyard as an example yeah. to record something in the sales process. Now, again, there's, there's different ways you can do this. It might be like cold outreach to someone who's never heard of you before and you send them a video, or it might be like helping a champion go and sell something internally so you can build a video with your face on it to, to help them use as a piece of collateral to help within their organization to move the buying process along. There's lots of different ways that video is being used in the sales process now. Is there anything that we should consider from a body language point of view when putting ourselves on camera to what is fundamentally an empty audience? Yeah. Watch it later on. Yeah, lovely, lovely. Uh, by the way, I'm a, I'm a massive Vidyard fan. They're a Canadian company for a, for a start. I think just up the road here. Yeah, they're a yeah. Yeah, just up the road in Waterloo, and uh, and I and I work with a a financial organisation, financial services organisation, right now, where where I pretty much exclusively focus on the use of Vidyard for them. Okay. So I've got a lot of experience in how you use these, you know, email video platforms really well. And here's my top tip for this: I think the most important thing those those platforms can do is create familiarity okay make you familiar make you family with with that audience now what is what is family sometimes we like our family and some we sometimes we don't but we, we're very dependent on them essentially and how do we know that they're family well they keep showing up time and time and time and time again okay they become familiar to us Something like Vidyard gives you an incredible opportunity for your face to show up in front of somebody time and time and time and time again. Okay. So that when they actually, when, so when you, for example, actually walk into a room, okay, or you actually manage to get them on a Zoom call, okay, or you pick up the phone and you go, hey, it's, it's Mark here. Yeah, they your face comes into their head when you walk in the room, they go, ah, yeah, I know that person. I know her. I know him. Yeah, I know them. Yeah, I, I, I recognize them. Mm -hmm. The brain doesn't have high neural load and go, who? Who's that? Who yeah. is that? Yeah, they have met you now. What people then say to me is, yeah, but Mark, you know, if you're being relentless about showing up, doesn't that get annoying? OK, well, look, let me tell you about this. Um, be, video is pop, okay? It's pop records, okay? It is disposable. This video that, you know, Aaron and I are making right now, you know, that it'll be around a while, but we'll make another. <laughs> we'll make it, you know, Aaron and I will get, will get together again and again and again. We'll make more. And this will become obsolete. And so, you know, if you're often going, you know, why do Mark and Aaron show up so much? You know, they show up in front of us on LinkedIn. Here they are again. Here they are again. Yeah. Those of you that are thinking that you're not here right now. 
you don't care about us okay it's okay in in the world of pop video either people know you or they don't care mm. yeah? they're like who yeah yeah banksy banksy said who's a, of course a the most important popular artist that we have on the planet right now he said they either love me or they hate me or they don't know who i am mm. okay well they just okay now for us because because you know we are not the greatest pop artists of our generation okay we're not that they either like us or they don't know who we are yeah that's a really okay? It's really so make 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 video make video show up relentlessly again and again and again and again and again because the pe because you'll show up one day for somebody and they'll go this is exactly the help i wanted thank you thank i've seen you. It. i've seen yeah it. I've, I've seen it i've mm -hmm. seen it like like it's like most people you know ghost you on the videos that you send out yeah and most of the world's population, you know, 7 billion people don't know who I am. Okay, a few of you do. And many of you showed up today for this because you've probably gone, yeah, I think Aaron and Mark are pretty helpful. Let's check in and see how it is. Yeah, everybody else doesn't care. There's nobody cursing us going, why do Aaron and Mark show up so much again and again and again relentlessly? It's because most people don't care about me. But I do it for those where it's for that day, for that moment, it's going to be helpful. Anyway, I hope that makes sense, Aaron. Yeah, it does indeed. I think the, the irony of that is, is that they're happy to be relentless with email but they're not happy to be relentless with video. And for me, it's like, if you've got one mechanism for getting your personality across, the, the best mechanism, it's not email. It's not the written word, it's it's video, right? Like no. all the things you've spoken about today in terms of body language, in terms of building trust and rapport, video is a far more effective mechanism for doing that than email. Yet someone will happily send a prospect 50 emails over the course of two months. Well, let me, let, me add, let me add one more thing to this, because I think this is an important word. When we see another human being's face, our responsibility towards them goes up, okay? We know this, I'm gonna be a bit bleak now. We know this from snipers, people who are employed to kill other people, okay, on, on demand, okay? They have to be trained specifically yeah, to be helped past the idea of feeling responsibility for that other human being who they're going to shoot. One of the most important things is seeing their face. If they see their face, it's harder. They shoot wide. Yeah, they, they unconsciously miss because of the responsibility to humankind. Okay, and it's an extraordinary thing, but it's true. If I can show up for you, you know, as much as possible, and you see my face, you will start to have a responsibility towards me okay now me as a great salesperson i'm looking to have a responsibility for you to you towards you because i want the best for you i want no remorse <laughs> yeah i want you to go thank you very much that was really helpful let's let's go let's let's buy okay yeah. but but it needs to be both ways you've got to have a responsibility towards me when i say hey let we need another meeting about this i need you to go okay mark i'll be there and we've all been in situations where a sales or leadership people don't show up to the meeting and it's like what where is their responsibility mm. well, you have no connection with them yeah, so of course right. they have no responsibility towards you they're being responsible with the people they have responsibility for so show up with your face in front of them video is is the most amazing economic way of doing that it blasts email every time yeah, I agree. I agree. I mean, when you read the statistics around email, now you're lucky if someone even reads your subject line, let alone reads your email and then responds to it. So right. different the video. So, so different the video. I guess there's, there's one last question before um, we start talking about where people can find your brilliant work and, and, and we sign off. And lastly, thank you for all the brilliant questions. I haven't been able to get yeah. through all of them. Um, and also thank you for everyone turning up as well. But we, we're kind of going to do one last question, if that's OK, is actually we've spoken a lot about the body language that we can display. The key question for me is if you could name maybe five of the top body language cues that we can look out for in our prospects for whatever purpose, what would be those kind of maybe not five, maybe three or so of those those key things we should be looking out for to determine where we are? Yeah. OK, so I'm going to go along the lines of we're going to look for optimism or pessimism. 
okay oh. <laughs> because it's a good because because all of us here are are delivering different services different products different and so i want to find what's a good generalization to go for and a good generalization is are they are they optimistic about the stuff that they should be optimistic i want them to be optimistic about or are they pessimistic about the stuff that i want them to be pessimistic about and not vice versa <laughs> okay yeah. um so let me let me rattle through uh some good generalizations around that okay how are they doing against gravity when somebody is optimistic, they, their fight against gravity will improve. Their power against gravity will improve. When somebody is pessimistic, their power against gravity will, will not be so good. So we need a baseline, okay? We're always going for how out of the norm was this from a generalized state of of you know just talking every day nothing optimistic or pessimistic or or what is their baseline for optimism if i can get them talking about you know their kids that they love you know or a pastime that they enjoy you know they're going to get more optimistic okay okay that's where i want them to reach i want them up there you know if i get them talking about you know what if what is it that you're not liking about the current service that you have or the current product that you have i want to see how gravity wins mm -hmm. against them okay so it's so up or down yeah now let's not mistake that for forwards and backwards approach or avoid because on approach they might you know, gravity might win as well yeah. okay so i got to take that into consideration but let's do approach and avoid when people are optimistic dopamine levels go up and they do the approach response when they're pessimistic dopamine levels go down and they do the avoid response but again what is the usual for them around around that uh let me give you just one more because that's kind of I'll, I'll count that as 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 four okay um let's go for yeah okay so let's go for open and closed okay so there's open body language where the vulnerable parts of the body are opened up that's pretty optimistic no pe no no predators in the room mm -hmm. less risk in the room okay pessimistic closing up around those vulnerable points on the body Okay, protecting the kill points on the body. That's pessimistic. Predators are in the room. Risk is in the room. So I think if I can, if I could just judge those variables, okay, gravity, up or down, okay, approach or avoid, okay, open or closed, okay, and any, and you, you know, that's not to say folding their arms means they're closed, okay, yeah. I got to baseline this because people, people fold their arms when they're making a decision by the way, <laughs> you know? Anyway, Aaron, I hope that's, that's useful. Yeah, that's super that useful, Mark. Listen, I, I, not only can I listen to you talk all day, there's been times when I've been on your YouTube channel where I have listened to you talk all day. So, <laughs> I, I, I genuinely really appreciate you taking the time to go through this. Now, before everyone rushes out the room, um, if people want to get in contact with you, Mark, or they want to see more of your stuff, what's the best way? Yeah, just go to truthplane.com, T-R-U-T-H-P-L-A-N-E, truthplane.com, and you'll find all the links to all kinds of different avenues. Do, do, you've probably come from LinkedIn today, so do follow me, follow Aaron uh, on LinkedIn as well, because both of us are posting up stuff all the time, relentlessly. You're right, yeah, always showing up. Well, lastly, guys, thank you for joining. Um, Big shout out to our uh, to our sponsors, which is Vidyard and uh, SalesFeed as well. Go check those guys out. And if you want to follow me or Mark, please do so. And uh, feel free to follow Flow State, and we'll continue to make more great webinars with great guests like Mark. So, Mark, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure as always, and I'll bid you a good day. See you all. Bye now. Cheers, guys. Take care. Bye. See you all. Bye.